Amen. I want to pray for all the pastors, Pastor Robert, uh, Sister Gabby, and Pastor Rudy and Amanda, and Pastor Peter and Jesslyn. Amen. I want to pray that God will just have his hand upon them, that uh, God will continue to, to move in their churches. I want to pray for the San Fernando churches. Amen. Panorama City, City of San Fernando, um, uh, Sun Valley. Amen. I uh, want to pray for Indio. Amen. Pastor Jorge, Sister Delfina, and of course, we want to keep our pastor, amen, Pastor Lorenzo, and Sister Stephanie, and Pastor Tony, and Sister Angelina in prayer, as, as God continues to use our life, amen. Um, this morning, we want, to, we want to continue praying for, for Esther, amen, their family, amen, her brother passed away, amen, and we want to pray for his two sons. And then we also want to pray, amen, for Tanasha McClinton, amen, she's fighting for her life, she has stage four cancer. And she's already been given a week to live, amen. And, uh, unfortunately, that's a, that's a familiar thing that most of us have dealt with, amen. You know, going into the last the last time, I remember when they told they called me and says, "Hey, Ben, you need to get to Pennsylvania." Why? The doctor just left and said she has a week to live, and she had one week to live, amen. I got there immediately, and just in time because the last the day I got there was the last day she was coherent and she was able to accept Jesus Christ, amen. amen. So you know what? We always want to pray for salvation. Amen. So let's let's pray for salvation for Tanasha McClinton and, and not just for her, but for the promises of God. You know, the Bible says, except the Lord Jesus Christ in your own household shall be saved. So we're going to believe in God, that God will not just receive her into the kingdom of heaven, but that God will leave, amen, his spirit upon those that are behind, that, that there'll be a legacy of people serving God from her family. Amen. So we want to pray for their family. We want to pray for her. Amen. That God will just be with them. Amen. So let's keep these people in our prayers. Amen. Amen. Uh, don't forget, continue praying for Mexico, South America, Europe. Amen. Continue praying for Paris, France. Amen. They're they're moving forward. They're in revival. God's bringing people. Um, they're going to have a big, they're going to have the, they're going to be in the middle of the Olympics this year out there. So we want to pray that God will just, God will just help them. Amen. Throughout the whole process, everything that they're doing, uh, God's really doing a work out there. So. Let's keep them in prayer, amen. Yeah. Amen. So you trust in God this this uh, morning. Um, you allow God to help you. Uh, also, let's pray for tonight, amen. We're having our Friday night fights, I mean, our Sunday night fight service tonight, amen. We have a guest preacher coming, amen. It's going to be a good time, amen. We're going to have a good, good, good message, good word of God. Be ready. Invite someone, amen. You're not going to want to miss tonight, amen. So we want to pray for tonight's service, amen, that God will just pour out his spirit, that God will not just bless his word, but that God will just make us fruitful as we invite somebody to come tonight. Amen. So you trust in God this morning. Let's cry to God. Amen. As we open up a prayer. Amen. So let's worship that. pray, God, that you that you just meet the needs of your people, God, as we come humbly before you, God. We pray, God, for families, God. We pray, God, for salvation in churches, God. But this morning, God, we pray, God, for Tanasha, God, that you just have your hand upon her, God. God, upon her family, God. God, uh, we pray, God, that thy will be done, God, if your will is to bring complete, miraculous healing, God, that no one can explain, uh, that you may be glorified, God, that thy will be done, God. But God, if not, we pray right now for salvation, God, for her, for her family, God, for all those the loved ones that bring comfort, God. And we pray, God, that you, that you be glorified, God, in all that we do. We thank you, God. Bless your word this morning, God. Open up our hearts, God, and touch us, God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You take time to greet someone this, this morning. <coughs>
What's up, dude? How you doing today? <laughs> Some announcements. Amen. Um, if you're wondering, no, not everybody's sick. All of us were sick, and all of us have fought a cold, and we were done with it. But it just left us with some congestions and sore throats. Not even sore throats, just froggy throats, I guess. I don't know. But that's why you say all this right. hand sanitizer, amen. Amen. So it's okay. My my daughter in law, she's sick right now. And I told her she got me sick. And then she said, I got you sick, you were sick first. So then I told her, Don't you ever say I never gave you nothing. I'm here for you. I share it all. Amen. Amen. So this morning we got some announcements. Just want to remind you our regular services every Sunday morning at 10, every Wednesday at 7. Amen. Um, tonight we have our Sunday night fight. Amen. It's, remember, it's the first and third Sunday of the month. This is the third Sunday. Our next one will be the first Sunday of next month. Amen. And I already got uh, another preacher lined up as we're going forward uh, for the second service of next, for the third, for the third week of next month. And uh, God's doing doing great things. I think on the first Sunday of next month, we're going to do a prayer meeting like we did the first one. We're going to come in and worship God. If you missed our first prayer meeting for this Sunday night fight, man, you missed a touch of God. Yes. Amen. We're going to do the same thing uh, um, on the first Sunday of May, and we're gonna we're just going to lay a hold of God and allow God to minister to our hearts. You know, you know, like we come to church and the preaching, and sometimes you know. Sometimes the preaching's good. The, the pastor here, he sometimes you don't know what he's talking about, but sometimes it's okay, you know. And, and and God can touch us, but you know, the preaching means nothing. It's 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 the it's the presence of God that really changes our lives. Amen. So we're gonna do a prayer meeting on our first Sunday of next month. Amen. And don't forget these dates, May fourth. Amen. San, Bern, San Bernardino. Uh, we're gonna do the outreach. Um, oh, next Sunday. Oh, never mind. The first Sunday of next month is our corporate service in Riverside. Amen. Our corporate service in Riverside. Amen. So next, uh, the first Sunday of next month for Sunday Night Fight will be our corporate service in the Riverside Church. Amen. Let's do our best to all be there, to be a part of what's going on. Pastor Robert and Sister Gavin, man, they support our church. I mean, they've been supporting us. Every time we're out of town, Pastor Robert comes to services. He's here. We cover for him. Him and his wife have been a blessing to us. Um, they've really helped a lot. Amen. The the church over there, they're praying for you guys all the time. So on May 5th, we're going to have the Sunday night service at the Riverside Church at 6 o'clock. Make time to be there. Amen. It's going to be a good time. All the churches are going to be there. We're going to pack the place and just have a good time in, in God. Amen. Yeah. So these are all the announcements. Amen. We're going to make up an offering. So let's worship God as well. Amen. This morning you give with an open heart. Amen. Um, I did order more the Zell cards. Um, and they won't come for like another week. So if you have you if you get through Zell, put it on a piece of paper. Just put your name in the in the dollar amount, and uh, and put it in the in the basket. That's what I do all the time. That's what I do all the time. Um, but when we get the Zell cards, use the Zell cards, of course. Remember um, to use Zell at uh, at IndieGive at IndieGive at gmail.com. Bring your ties, give an offering, support missions, amen. So let's let's bow our hearts as uh, Brother Angel bless the gift from the Father God, uh, Father God, we ask that you bless these ties and these offerings that brought before you this morning. We ask that you bless those that continue to give faithfully in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And what mighty God we serve. What mighty God we serve. The angels are before him.
Children, get out. <laughs> All the children, we love you. You're so wonderful. You're God's creation. You're heaven sent. Praise the Lord. Now get out. No, not really. Wake that diaper This morning, I'm gonna I want to talk about a title that that God gave me yesterday, and I was thinking about maybe putting a sermon together and and talking about it. Um, maybe uh, the next week or two. But sometimes God will give me these 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 thoughts, these ideas, these sermons, and. And and I and, and I'll be praying. I'd be dealing with it. I'm reading, and 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 before you know it, I'm putting a sermon together. Some of these sermons will take me a few weeks to put together. Some sermons have taken me months to put together because I, I, I and, and most pastors do this. We get these 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 thoughts, and God gives us these ideas and gives us these scriptures. But we begin to put things together, and little by little, we build on it, and God just brings forth the word. So that's all I do with this one. But this morning, God woke me up early, could not go back to sleep, and I said, okay, I'll get up. I went and sat down and prayed, and God gave me a message. The title of this message is, come with me. When you go to somewhere like Disneyland, you go into the Haunted Mansion, they'll say, they'll, they'll tell you, follow me, right? As they give you the, follow me, follow you to the Haunted Mansion. I remember when when we were young converts in Ontario, we did this this Halloween haunted house. We had a building not that big, not much bigger than this, you know, smaller than this, by sure, for sure. And we we emptied out all the church stuff and completely made temporary walls like a maze in the church. And each section, we had little rooms, cubby rooms, in, all the way through. And the last section was was a scene. It was little dramas throughout the whole thing. It was where everything was mic'd, and uh, it was pretty good. It was a haunted house, and the haunted house wasn't your typical just scary moment things. It wasn't that. It was about sin. And what we had, we had the 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 Grim Reaper, and his job was to bring you for a tour. So the Grim Reaper. Uh, Brother Frank, what he would do is, is he would say, come with me. And he would follow you in, take you to the first scene. And the first scene was was uh, 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 teenagers at a, uh, going to a prom. We had a door to a car there and, and broken stuff on the ground and, and a teenager dying, dead and people crying over him. You know, drunk driving accident. And we moved on to the next scene Actually, uh, Brother Jesse was was in the next scene, and it was that one was a good scene. It was suicide. And matter of fact, I just found the, the we used the starter pistol. A twenty it runs with twenty two blanks, twenty two twenty two calibers, but they're blanks. So when you shoot it, it actually goes off like a gun. It sounds just like a gun. And when you're in a small confined space, it's really loud. And he would sit there, and he was, I can't take it no more. I'm sick and tired of my life. I, I hate this. <laughs> Right, and the strobe light goes off and he shoots himself in the head. We had one of the pastor's twin boys behind him. He's sitting like right here. And then behind him, one of the pastor's twin boys were behind him, shoots himself in the head and just and the strobe light, as soon as he hits that thing, the pastor's son would throw a red oatmeal at the wall. Yep. Looked like brain was splattered. Uh, Moved on, green reapers follow me. The point was to show people of sin. We had one scene about abortion where we actually had a gurney. We had a, 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 a couple of nurses sitting there talking about their lunch and everything as they're ripping out pieces of a baby. We even put, we used like spaghettis and 
three fives and yeah. I mean, it was bloody it was gross and it stunk oh, yeah. even through uh doll arms and legs in there for effect mm -hmm. and in that part we were throwing a black light and we had a girl who was a young like maybe 11 12 years old who was one of our relatives we actually just seen her the other day she's in her 40s now and she would stand there real quiet and real pale dressed in white with the black light making her glow and the nurse and everybody get quiet. And she would sit there, she says, Mommy, what happened? Didn't you love me? You know, making it real sorry, making people understand, right? This is the, this is the reality of what life is. We had a scene, scene I was in was, was we had Jesus on the cross. We had brother Eric on the cross. We had Eric there because he was, he was skinny. He had long hair. When he let it down, he looked like Jesus. Yeah. Let him on the cross. <laughs> had him in a little diaper. And uh, and my job was, I was the devil and I was whipping him. And uh, as I was doing that, the Grim Reaper sitting there saying, you see, this is what your sin's doing. Because of your sin, he gets to whip him. And we just went on and on. And the last scene was a, was a hell scene. The whole stage was this, was this, was the length. And we drew all these things and made it look like flames. And, you know, of course, you know, we're amateurs. But it was black lights and strobe lights. And it was pretty effective. We had a guy on the ground with his shirt ripped open. And we had a guy dressed like a demon. And he was going around ripping out, pulling out spaghetti and stuff out of his guts and putting it in his mouth. It was pretty gruesome. Every scene had to do with sin. The thing was, and actually, I want to do that here one day. <coughs> it would be good if we, if one of these buildings was empty during that time when we can actually go in there, build it all up for, for one month, and then tear it all down. The point is simple. The guy says, follow me. And he, take, he took you through a life, showing you sin, showing you the other things that destroy people's lives. Many times we go, you can go somewhere, and you get tour guides. The Haunted Mansion will, will do a vocal tour guide as they bring you in. You go to Universal Studios, you have tour guides. You picture on the screen. A lot of times you have a tour guide saying, so come follow me, right? He says, follow me, follow me, follow me. And then he stops and lets you fall off the cliff. This is the reality. A lot of times, follow me, follow me, follow me. Come with me, come with me, come with me. But yet, you're still standing alone. <laughs> and this is a lot of times where we are we stand alone but if we're not careful follow me, follow me, follow me we become puppets and we're doing things that we don't know why things that we normally don't do I've seen strong Christians people, men of God and when I say men of God I'm talking about men that I would travel on a Monday after work to go hear them preach at 7 o'clock at night and I would take 2-3 hours to get there I would have to get off work early go home hurry up, get dressed, get changed, jump in the car pick up everybody and we take off 2-3 hours to go hear a man preach for a men's class starts at 7 we wouldn't get out of there until about 9.30 because everything's running late we wouldn't get home until about midnight Powerful, powerful, life-changing preaching. Men of God that would preach a sermon that would just, you feel like they had the keys to the gate in heaven. I've seen these men turn back to alcohol, backslide, and never make it back to, make, make it back. I know of a pastor, powerful preacher, good ministry, turned around, backslid, and died literally died in an insane asylum. He was he was part of what he was inside of a mental hospital when he died. Because if we're not careful when people say come with me, follow me. If we're not paying attention to who they are and what they're doing. If we're not standing on the word of God, we end up like this in puppets. Yesterday in Hollywood Universal Studios tour and the tram. You ever been to the back lot Universals? We have season passes right now. We've gone like three times. 
figure. Anyways, Universal Studios, the back lot. Yesterday the tram was going down the hill. The driver lost a little bit of control, couldn't get the tram to stop. The last cart ended up rolling over with four people. Fifteen wind up in the, went to the hospital, one of them in critical condition. Follow me, the tour guide says. Let me show you the wonders of television. Let me show you the wonders of the world. Let me take you to a live plane crash. Let me take you to the world of illusion. Follow me. Come with me. And this is, this is the method of the world. This is what the world has to offer us. Our friends, our family, the people who are not serving God, who we love and we need to love because we'll never get them to the kingdom of heaven if we don't love them. But when we compromise who God is, we end up in this kind of manner. We end up in these kind of situations. And this is why I want to talk about this today. We have this misconception that, well, Christians, they hate this and they hate that. Or, or this church hates this and this church hates that. That's not true. To me, I treat all sin the same. Sin is sin. I don't care who you are or what you've done in life. Man, we've all fallen short. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know when the Bible says that? It's not just talking about people outside the church. It's talking about people inside the church. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're not perfect. The Bible says, who's perfect? The Bible says, no one's perfect. No, not one, right? We're not perfect. But does it mean that we strive to go ahead and do whatever we want? Or do we continue to try to follow God? You see, the devil's real today. The devil's not here to, to tickle your feet. That's not what he's here for. He's here to bring confusion to your life. He's here to bring distractions to your life. He's here to say, hey, come follow me. Come with me. I, you're going to be okay. I'm going to show you a couple things. And don't by any, any, any wild imagination think that the, that the salvation you carry, that the spirit of God and strength that you can possess today will keep the devil away forever. Oh no. He's sitting. He's waiting. He wants you. That's why we got to continue. They don't think that we're so special that he will avoid me. But I go to New Destiny now. And the devil stays away from them. Have you seen the pastor? Oh no. The devil loves me. He's always trying to attack me. So I want to read from the book of Matthew chapter 4. Verse 1 through 11. <clears throat> if you have an idea that you think that the devil won't bother you, let's see who the devil does bother. Because in this story, he goes straight to the top. He goes straight to the source. Book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. The Bible says this. It says, then Jesus was, was led up. Remember, come follow me. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward, he was hungry. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, This is Jesus. This is what, Jesus what did Jesus respond? He says, It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Verse 5. Then the devil took him up into the holy city. Come follow me. Come with me. Set him on the pinnacle of the temple, highest point, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again the devil took him up an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. 
And then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall serve, shall you serve. Amen. Verse 11. Then the devil laughed him. And behold, angels came and ministered to him. God, I pray God to bless your word. We thank you, Lord. Just let me pray, man. I want to look at a couple things in this story. First of all, the devil came to Jesus. When did the devil come to Jesus? When he was fasting. When he was fasting. But did he come in the beginning? Uh -uh. He came after he's been fasting for 40 days. 40 days and 40 nights. That's when he came to him. He came to him when he was hungry. He came to him when, when, he, when he saw that there was going to be a physical weakness. You see, when we're hungry, sometimes we can make decisions that you would not typically make. Go places you wouldn't normally go to. You will eat things that you don't normally eat. This is what happens when you're hungry. When you're hungry, things get a little bit different for you. When you get hungry, you become hangry. Yeah. Right? You, 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 become, you become a little bit different than normal. Your character changes when you're hungry. You're, you're typically a nice person, full of life. But then you get hungry. And all of a sudden, you're angry. You're mad. The world's coming to an end. One of the, one of the, most, the most, most frequent argument of any couple is, what do you want to eat? I don't know what you want to eat. What do you feel like? <coughs> I don't know. What do you feel like? What? Right? I don't know food. And before you know it, you just don't listen to me. <laughs> you think, well, you know, I remember the other day she said that she liked that one. Let's go to that one restaurant. And you know, I know where we go. Let's go to that one restaurant. Oh, now you want to take me to that restaurant? <laughs> the other day I wanted to go. You don't want to take me. I had no money the other day. Anyways. <laughs> when we're hungry, things happen, Something things like change. Please try. You see, it is in the time of physical need and desire that the enemy tries to tear us down. As you serve God, you must learn to live differently. You got to learn to eat differently. You got to learn to think differently. You got to learn to act differently. Because when we serve God, we become different people, right? We're in this world, but we're not what? We're not of this world. We're in this world. What does that mean? Hey, I got to go through everything everyone else has to go. I got bills just like the guy down the street has bills. I got people in my life that get sick just like the people in that, down the street. I got to deal with my health just like them down the street have to deal with their health. But the difference between me and them is I get to go through it with my Lord. I get to go through it with God. I got a quick connection to him. I've already accepted him. I already have the salvation. And now I can bring that to them. You see, it's important to have this relationship with, with God. But I'm in this world, so I got, I got to learn to be different. I can't be who I was before. Because what we're doing is a spiritual battle. This right here, who we are, is a spiritual battle. So when the Bible says that, Jesus, that, that the devil comes to Jesus, he comes to him after he's been fasting for 40 days. Because he's looking at the physical, at the physical uh, structure or being of who Jesus is at the time because he sees Jesus as the man. But in John 6, 35, this is what Jesus says. John 6, 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. See, when we lack food, we become weak. As Christians, we need to hunger and thirst for God, for his word, for his spirit. You can't, you can't, you can't be hungry and think you're going to battle the devil. You can't. So when Jesus, when the Bible says that the devil comes to Jesus after 40 days that he hasn't eaten, and he, and he sees the weakness of a physical, of a physical being, because I'm sure Jesus was hungry. He was physically tired. You would be physically tired. Remember, he was all God, but he was also all man. 
Now, we put that into our perspective. None of us are fasting for 40 days. I mean, just look around us. Who are we, who are we trying to lie to? We know we ain't fasting for 40 days, right? So we ain't fasting for 40 days. What's that guy, Paul Bart's name? Um, Malkoff. Okay. What's his real name? Kevin James. Kevin James. They say he just did like a 41-day fast, liquid fast, and lost like 100 pounds. He lost a ton of, ton of weight. He was hungry. He just got tired of he got tired of his stomach, but he, he was hungry. A lot of celebrities doing it. But when Jesus, when, when when the devil looks at Jesus and he sees he sees the physical element of his weakness, right? So he begins to attack. He begins to go after him. As we live for God, we're going to be hungry. Obviously, none of us here are hungry for food. We might be hungry right now. I mean. So always you get you get ready for church in the morning and the first thing we're talking about is so what are we gonna eat after church? You are talking about what you know what my, my 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 pastor he he always says Christians are when they're out eating, they're typically talking about where they're gonna go eat next. They're always talking about the next place they're gonna go eat. Because that's what we do, we eat, right? But now that we live for God, we're different. We're spiritual. That's why Jesus says, I am the bread of life. When you come after me, you'll never thirst again. So after 40 days of being without food, the devil enters, right? We're spiritual beings now. We go 40 days without God. What does that leave us? That's why it's crucial to be faithful to the things of God. You miss, you miss, amen. Uh, well, we'll start with this. When you miss a church service, you're becoming spiritually weak. We think we don't, but this is what happened. It, 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 the devil came against Jesus. Don't think he won't come against you. How, how are we more superior than Jesus? The devil saw weakness in Jesus. That's what he thought. So he went after him. He thought Jesus was going to be weak. Jesus was strong because he knew the strength came from the spirit, not from the flesh. But when we miss church, what do we do? We become spiritually weak because we're not superior than Jesus. But let's take it to the next level. Every day, when we don't take time to read the word of God and say, God, I need my daily bread. I need to eat this. Because who, who, I, who I am isn't who you are. I need to make a change and begin to read your Bible daily. Get that, that, that daily spirit, that daily fruit, that daily bread. And when we begin to miss that, we're going to become spiritually weak. Why? Because we become spiritually hungry. Now let's take it another step. A lot of times, the only time we pray is when we're going to eat a food. We're going to say, you know what, and, 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 and if Whenever I go out to with my pastor, he always makes sure I'm the one praying for the food. He wants me to bless food all the time. Because I say it like this. Come on, Father, I pray God to bless food in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's eat. I'm ready to go. I ain't playing no games. I'm going to eat. Right? So he says, we'll be somewhere, and I'll be at the end of the table. Got 20 people on, on the table. And he'll be like, Ben, pray for the food. <laughs> Amen, Pastor. I know what you want. You want to eat. <laughs> but many times as Christians... We take that as our prayer life. This is who we are. Jesus says, no, I'm the bread. I'm the bread of life. When you come after me, you'll never thirst again. You'll never be hungry again. See, it was during the time of the fast that, that the enemy thought that he can come and defeat Jesus. But Jesus knew that it was a relationship with his father, a man that brought all the strength. The devil didn't see that. When we're, when we're living for God, we got to understand that the devil's going to come and says, hey, come follow me. Let me take you to some places where I can show you what I can give you. I'm going to take you to the mountaintop to the pinnacle of the church, and I'm going to let you know what I'm going to give you. And in our spiritual weakness, what happens is we become so hungry, we begin to eat the things that we shouldn't be eating. You see, when you get hungry, you eat things that you don't typically eat. There's a, there's a, 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 True story, and they made a movie about it, about the soccer team that, or rugby team that, that, that crashed in South America in the mountains. And they were stranded there. And as people began to die, they began to eat their flesh. That's pretty messed up, right? They were starving to death. Starving to death. Well, I would never eat that. You ain't never been starving to death either. Never. My pastor's wife... Her kid, the kids, the pastor's kids, I'm talking about my pastor's kids. Their kids would say, I'm hungry, I'm starving. 
And his wife would always get mad at him. You're not starving. You don't know what starving is. You have no idea what starving is. I remember one time when I was a kid, my mom made food. And I didn't want to finish. I was full. I was done. And she threw that famous mother line. Did you know there's kids in Africa who are starving to death right now? <laughs> and me being me, I was probably only about eight, nine years old. I thought, well, give it to them. <laughs> and I did. Well, give it to them. I don't want it. <laughs> we don't know what starving is. I've been to countries where they eat things that you wonder, whoa. In Peru, they have a thing called cuy. And it's, it's a rat. It's a rat. It's a stinking rat. They say, they say they're say they guinea pigs. It's a rat. I've seen it. It's a rat. <laughs> they get it, put a stick through it, roast it. Hamanos. Oh, God. I remember when I was a kid, I had some friends who were, I'll just say they were islanders. And I went to the house early in the morning on a Saturday. A bunch of little pigs running around. A bunch of little pigs. I mean, I'm talking, I mean, I said, I mean like a hundred of them. They're going to have this, this party in the evening. I go, what the heck are those pigs? Right? I'm all excited. I'm a little kid. What do I know? <laughs> what they did is they got that pig alive, shoved a stick right through it, then threw it on the fire, cooked them. Then each of them, they had their own pig. They throw it on the plate, all happy, and they cut the belly, all the guts will fall out, and they eat everything. That's what they did. Well, I'll never eat that. I've never been that hungry. I'll never eat. I'm never going to be that hungry. When you're hungry, you eat things. Right? You take in things that you normally wouldn't take in. I'll tell you what, I, I have no desire to eat kui. It's like a kukui. I don't want to do it, right? <laughs> But I tell you what, if it's my life or that rat's life, I bet you he's going to die before I do. Guarantee that. Right? Would I go down to Standard Brothers and buy a coolie off the shelf? No way. But if I'm going to die, and when we're spiritually weak, they come follow me. Come with me. Oh, okay. We'll go with you. We begin to eat the things that the world has to offer us that we don't realize that we're eating. We don't realize that we're eating. When we participate in things that we shouldn't participate, you realize that we co-sign it. We say, I allow that. I agree with that. Now, there's things that happen in our lives and our loved ones. And, you know, our loved ones, you know, they're in sin. And that's okay. We love them. And we accept them. But it doesn't mean that we co-sign their sin. We just say, hey, I accept them. It doesn't matter what your sin It doesn't matter what the sin is. Sin is just sin. It doesn't matter. Anybody can be delivered from anything. It doesn't matter what it is. No matter the love of God, don't ever be so spiritually weak that you stop loving people. Because sometimes we stop eating the bread of life and we become weak. But here's something that caught my attention. When the devil came to Jesus, what did he tell him? He said, if you are the son of God, he started his conversation. If you are the son of God. If you are a child of God is what, is what the devil's telling him. How many times have we heard these words as we serve God? We're told the same thing in different words. You're a Christian? You ever heard that? You're a Christian? Or how about the, I, I thought you went to church. Isn't that the same thing? That's what, that's what the devil told Jesus. If you're the son of God. If you're the son of God, okay. Right on. All right, Jesus. All right, Jesus. You're the son of God. All right, all right. Hanging out with all those sinners. You're the son of God. How many times have we heard that? If you're the son of God. If you're a child of God. Oh, you're a Christian? And if we're not careful, we can begin to feed and eat off of that. Hey, maybe, you know what? Maybe they're right. It might be okay. Maybe this is okay. Maybe that's okay. Maybe they're a little right. Maybe that's okay. That's why in 1 Peter 5.8, 1 Peter 5.8, Peter says, 
Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around, walks about like a roaring lion, lion, seeking whom he may devour. Peter says, be sober. Hey, stop getting high. Stop getting drunk. Knock it off. He says, stay in your right mind. Stay in your right mind. Stop thinking crazy. Stay sober-minded also means be in the word of God and stop listening to garbage, other, other garbage. Well, this is okay. This feels good. The biggest thing that gets, that gets Christians in trouble is when they begin with the word, I feel or I think. Because our feelings and our thoughts is what was taking us to hell in the beginning. Our feelings and our thoughts don't get us nowhere. What does the word of God tell us? What does Jesus Christ tell us? Where does the spirit of God take us to? If you are the son of God. Peter says, be vigilant, be sober-minded. Don't cloud your thought process. Don't think that, don't think your own way. Doesn't the Bible say, my thoughts are not your thoughts? My ways are not your ways? For my thoughts and my ways are higher than your ways. See, the devil's a punk. He's a liar. And we must remember, he is not going to take a break. He's not going to stop because he's tired. He's not going to say, you know what, maybe not today because, you know, I want them to do good. No, he's watching and he's waiting to pounce upon us. This is why when Jesus said in, in John 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never be thirsty. And when Jesus says this, he's giving us a warning. He is reminding us and letting us know that we are not going to survive without him. Amen. We must never forget where our strength comes from. You got to understand. We hear <coughs> we hear the pastors always tell us you got to be in church. You got to be in church. You gotta be in church. You gotta be in church. Why are not you in church? It's funny if somebody doesn't come to church and I call them because I'm going to call them about something else and they miss church. The first words out of their mouth is the explanation justifying why they didn't come to church. I didn't even ask them about that. They're just justifying why they didn't come to church. Well, you understand, you know, why I, you know, Pastor, you know, the other day it was just really rough. Like, you know, I didn't turn out, you know, why it was hard, you know, you just don't know. You know. We're talking yesterday. And uh, we we're talking to Pastor Rudy and Sister Maddie yesterday at the house. And we're talking about, you know, just history and stuff, you know. And, and we're, me and Martha were reflecting about one time. Somebody told us a couple talking about outreach, right? This one was in the Fontana Church, and and they tell us because on outreach, you know, you go pass the flyers back to the church. That's what outreach is. You go and you reach the people who are out. You know? Pass them, hey, I'd like to invite you to church. Obviously, you said right away, Jesus Christ. You know, God loves you. Can I pray with you? Okay, like, hey, you know, we'll have a good day. I'll be back. You know, we just move on about our day. And the subject of the meeting that we had, we had. I wasn't in charge of it. I was just, you know, just one of the church pastor was, was, come on, you guys, you got to be on time. You got to be on time. You guys got to be on time. You know, be on time for church. Be on time for outreach. Right? So I'm going to tell you guys, be on time. Be on church for church. Be on time for outreach. Be on time. Come early for prayer. And the subject was, that was the subject of what we we're talking about. <clears throat> and, and me and Martha were like dumbfounded. We had just gotten to the Fontana Church. We are like, why are they on time? I don't get it. It didn't make sense to us because my first pastor, hey, you better be on time. There's no joke with that one. Give me out the whip. So, so then one of the one of the couples turned to us, me and Martha. They had no idea what they were going to get next, but they turned around and says, "You guys just don't understand. Your kids are big." So Martha, dude, Martha says, oh, hold, on, "Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a minute." Now my kids are teenagers right now, but you think they stepped? You think they came out with tennis shoes on their feet and walked out of me? Well, that's not the way it worked. We pioneered our first church with three kids, and our youngest was two years old. And they were all with us on outreach, two to five, two, two, two to five years old. All of our kids, and we were on outreach, pioneering a church, brand new in a city. We knew zero people. So tell me about being on time. We know how to be on time. So when I call people, hey, you know what else is going? Oh, well, you know what? They start talking about their whatever, whatever they told themselves to make them feel better. 
That's why Jesus gives us the warning. He tells us, he tells us, he's reminding us, letting us know that we can't survive with him. He's the bread of life. We can't say we have the bread of life if, if we're more faithful to the things outside of God than we are to the things of God. Well, God is my savior. He's, my, he's, my, he's the bread of my life. He's the bread of life. I eat the word of God eh, in my time, though. How can we can't do that? God says, no, I'm the bread of life. You got a hunger and thirst after me. Do you, you get that? He says, I'm the bread of life. You come to me, you'll never thirst again. He's telling us we need to hunger and thirst for him. That's it. For him. In order to survive, we have to eat food. We have to drink water. We have to. We'll dehydrate or we'll, we'll get pulled into famine and die, right? Our body will eat itself. And before you know, we're going to shut down and we die. That's the reality of it. You've got to have that balance. Jesus says, I'm the, I am the bread and the life. I'm the one that can, that can quench your thirst. You need me just like you need air to breathe. This is what Jesus is trying to tell us. He's given us a warning. This is why the devil tries to get to turn, gets Jesus to turn the stones into, in, into bread. So when the devil attacks Jesus with this, right? Jesus, turn those stones into bread that you may eat. What does Jesus say? What was the response of God in the flesh? He says, it is written. When Jesus says it is written, anywhere in the Bible when you see it is written, you'll find this typically in the New Testament, and it's always referencing Old Testament scripture. It says it is written. What that means, it is the statement that it's stating is the scripture says this. It means there's, there's a scripture that this is what it quotes. So when Jesus says it is written, he is quoting scripture. He is saying, no, you don't understand. The word of God is more powerful than you, devil. You have no power because the word of God is stronger than you because it is written this way. It is written. And because it is written, it is law. Because it is written, it is happening. Because it is written, it is truth. And that's what Jesus tells the devil, right? <clears throat> this is why it's important that we that we don't miss a meal. See, it is in the time that you least expect that you will need to draw from that well of God and lean on the power of his word. See, the devil's not dumb. He has been doing this. He's been doing what he's doing for a very long time. And he and he continued to talk to Jesus. You know that even, even the devil uses the word of God against Jesus? In verse 5, the devil, the devil takes, takes Jesus to the holy city. He questions his salvation by saying, if you're the son of God, right? He questions his salvation. Jesus, if you're the son of God, Jesus. And then he tries to put doubt by stating, for it is written. So even though, even though Jesus gave him scripture and said, I stand on the word of God because it is law. The devil says, okay, I got you. Check this out. It is written that won't the angels give charge over you? That you won't dash yourself against the rocks? Isn't that what the devil tells them? It is written. Which means not only do we need to know the word of God, but we also got to, we also got to know God. So you're not going to survive if you're not praying. You're not going to survive if you're not reading. We got to be in prayer. We got to have that relationship. We got to be in communion with God. We got to be able to say, God, my heart is in your hands. I am listening to your voice. Because I am listening to the word of God. I am reading the word of God. But this by itself won't let me survive. I need more, God. I need you, God. Because even the devil is quoting the Bible. How do you know? It's for it is written. It's in the Bible. And who do you quote it to? Jesus himself. So what makes us more superior than Jesus that he ain't going to do it to us? If he's doing it to Jesus, you know he's going to do it to us. For it is written. See, right here, when the devil does it, he's, try, he's, a, he's, he's attempting to use the word of God against Jesus.
A lot of times people will use the word of God against your Jesus. No, they don't. Yeah, they do. No, they don't. Yeah, they do. Well, they don't, they're not taking me to sin. But listen to this. How many times have you heard this? You can miss one service. It's okay. You can miss one service. Surely you're not going to go to hell if you miss one service. It's okay. Or how about this? You can go to that other church. Oh, God is God, right? How many times we hear that? God is God no matter what church we're going to. Or how about this one? This is a good one. One drink. One drink is not sin. Doesn't it say no drunkard? Hey, I'll just have one beer. I'm okay. Take it a step further. You know, the Bible doesn't even talk about smoking. <clears throat> oh, God gave us herb. Right? That's okay. But what does Paul say to all this? Paul says, don't do anything that will cause your brother to stumble. He don't even say you. Paul says that live a life that is so clean that when people look at you, that they know you're serving God. Because the things that you do is going to cause that person over there to never make it to heaven. Oh, but it's okay. No drunkard. I had one beer. Oh, I'm, you know what? I, for my body weight and height, yeah, I can have a couple beers and not be drunk, so I'm okay. Paul says, don't do nothing that's going to cause your breath to stumble. Yeah, you may think that you got it under control. That's okay. Maybe your one beer won't take you to half. Maybe you want to think that way. That's fine. But you know what? Getting your brother to stumble might. Getting your, bro your brother away from heaven might. So it goes deeper. But how will you know this if we don't read the word of God? How will you know what's true if we don't pray to God? How will we know? That's why it's important. For it is written. It is, in during, it is during these times that you will need to not just remind the devil who is in charge, but you will need to say it out loud so that you also remember the devil has no power over your God. You know it's important that you speak words out loud? It's important. It's important you say it out loud. It's important that when you pray to God, Take time to pray out loud. We get the old religious background where we, where we think we have to pray in silence. Heck no, man. I make all kinds of noise when I pray. I do. I make all kinds of noise when I pray. You know what, God? I pray right now in the name of Jesus, God. Touch me, God, because you know what? My mind is so corrupted. It's so jacked up, God. I need a cleansing. I need a touch from heaven. God, you know what? Do as Lazarus said and just... You know, just let Lazarus' finger just touch the water and put it on my tongue that I might be cleansed and, 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 and be refreshed for just a moment, God. Because I feel so dirty, so filthy, God. Yeah, I know I'm the pastor, God, but you know what, God? I am a man just like everyone else, and I want to live for you, God. we got to say these words out loud. God, I am a sinner who is trying to be a saint, and I am struggling. God, I know you love them, God, and I am trying, God, but they're making it hard. God, help me with that anger. Help me with that hate. God, you know what, Lord? I, I know I, I, I know that you know what? I shouldn't be drinking that, God. But I want it so bad and it tastes so good. God, I need you to touch me, God, that I no longer thirst after that. God, it is you, God, that I get strength, God. I need your spirit, not the smoke. We need to say these words out loud. God, I, 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 God, I surrender. We need to tell God, God, I am done. I surrender. I no longer do this, God, because it is you that gives me strength, God. I am a weak man without you, God. I can do nothing without you, God. Without you, I am nothing. We need to say these words in confidence, knowing where we fail. Because if you don't say where you fail, tell God, give me strength, you'll never believe that you failed. As long as I don't say it out loud, I know it's not true. Meanwhile, the only person that we're fooling is ourselves. And that's part of that tour. Hey, come with me. Hey, follow me this way. Narrow is the gate, but wide is the way. Isn't that what the Bible says? 
Why is the way that leads to destruction? <clears throat> this is why Peter says, be sober, be vigilant. Because our adversary, that means our enemy, the one who's trying to destroy us, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's just looking, he's just on the prowl. We need to remember where our strength comes from. Remember, in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus says, All authority in heaven has been given to me on earth. This is where our power comes from. This is where our strength comes from. It doesn't come from the thought process that makes sense from a friend. The, one of the things that I see that, that's hurt so many marriages, that's hurt so many, so, many, so many good Christians, people who are living for God, is the advice of a sinner. Sound advice from a sinner. Let me explain. There's people who are really good people. I know sinners who don't serve God, atheists, don't even want to believe in God, who act better than most Christians more loving than most Christians. And it's the truth, it's the reality. It's what they are, which is wrong. Shouldn't we be the light of the world that brings people to salvation? Shouldn't who we are, the reflection of God in our life, be evident that people see us and say, you know what, I need that in my life? But there's people who don't live for God, who, 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 who question whether it, there's even existence of heaven, who treat people better. This is the reality of the life of the world that we live in. And it's these same people that will come and bring sound advice. Sounds really good. It works good for people in the world. But when it comes to a Christian man, a Christian woman, it's not sound advice if it isn't from heaven. Well, but it sounds like it's from heaven. It appears like it's from heaven. You know that if you put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig? It really is. It's like praying for your food. You got you got you got some ribs, you got some corn, you got some some macaroni and cheese, you got a chocolate cake, you got apple pie. None of it's sugar free, amen. You got you got hamburgers and fries, amen, and your diet coke, amen. It's sitting right there. <laughs> and in all that, let's pray for the food. God, I pray right now, God, you anoint this food. Sanctify, God. Make it nourish you to my body, God. God, that it may, they may just, just nourish my body. Boy, darn well, this is going to give you diabetes. Amen. But God, sanctify it, Lord. Sanctify it. Right? It is what it is. You're still eating the same thing. If you want God to bring nourishment to your body when it comes to food, eat food that brings nourishment to your body. Hey, that's a revelation. Right? Doesn't that make sense? It's just simple, it's a simple math, right? God, bless me with the job. God, I need a good job, God. But I'm going to sit in my room playing Nintendo. I'm going to play PlayStation, God, and have that company, that Fortune 500 company, come knock on my door, God. You never put an application. I know you're going to get a job if you put an application in. <coughs> so you got to be careful. How are we going to make heaven our home if we're not ever trying to reach it ourselves now? You're saying, God, take me to heaven, but I'm not going to walk there. God, take me to heaven, but I ain't going to try to get there on my own. God, take me to heaven. I don't need to know anything about it until I get there. No, we go on vacation. We, we, we went to Europe. And we went to three different countries. And we researched each area that we knew we were going to be at. Looking for, we looked for everything from places to go see, places to eat, transportation, ground transportation. We looked for, we researched it. So when we got there, we didn't waste time. We were already running when we got there. If we do that here, we say, we, we went to El Centro just a couple weeks ago. We prepared ahead of time. We planned ahead of time. We, we made reservations. We got money ahead of time. We knew what, we're gonna, what we had to spend. We knew the clothes we had to take. We prepared for this because we we're going to go on this vacation or, 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 or conference, and we knew that we had to have certain things in order so we can get there and make it successful. But yet, the kingdom of God, we don't prepare for. God, take me to heaven, God. But don't talk to me about not doing things anymore. 
Don't talk to me about faithfulness, God. Don't talk to me about removing sin from my life, God. How dare you take this away from me? I will prepare to go to, to L.A. I will prepare to go to El Centro. I will prepare to go to Europe. I will prepare to go to Mexico. But I ain't going to prepare to go to heaven. How does that make sense? How does it make sense? You know, every time I cross the Mexico border, I make sure I have my passport with me. You know why? Because I want to make sure I come home. Do you know every time I leave my house, I got my Bible with me. Because I want to make sure I make it home. We make sure other things are around us and we leave out God. See, the trials, the temptations are, going to, are, are not going to stop attacking you. It's going to happen. They will always, they will always want to return. The problems always existed. It just, it just seems now that we're, that we are saved that we just notice them a lot more. The problems that you have today are the same problems we've been dealing with for years. We just notice them more now because we think that we're in a bubble. We've got to remember and do what Jesus said in, in, four, in Matthew 4.10 when he says, after all this conversation, after the devil's trying to tempt and after the devil's trying to use the word of God against him, after the devil questioned his salvation, <clears throat> what did Jesus say? He used his words. He spoke them out loud. If it worked for Jesus, it's got to work for us. How can it, something different work for us if it didn't work for Jesus? Jesus out loud told the devil in Matthew 4.10, he says, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you, sh you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And the Bible says, and the devil left, and here's something that's important that you cannot forget. Jesus told the devil, you shall worship the Lord, your God. He's telling the devil, don't forget, even you're going to bow down to me. The devil doesn't have power above God. Jesus reminded him, he says, the Lord, your God. He says, you know what? It's not, it's not just these people. I'm your Lord too. You have no power. You will bow down to me. And you shall worship me too, he says. It is not, it is not a question. It is not a, it's not a suggestion. This is going to happen, Jesus says. He says, you shall worship the Lord your God and put him under submission. You want to get through the trials. You want to make in your salvation. You can't listen to the sound advice of, of someone else. You've got to listen to the word of God. You've got to build your own relationship with Jesus Christ. You've got to read the word of God. And you got to tell the devil, you know what, devil, you have no authority in my life because even you're going to bow down to my God. Who do you think you are? Get out of here, devil. you got to remember where the power comes from because it's in Jesus Christ that we find our strength. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. we gotta, we got to remember where it comes from. Imitate Christ and watch people imitate you. This is why as Christians, we need to surround ourselves with more Christians. If we are surrounded by, by saved people, we will act like saved people. There's a revelation. If you hang around with people who are living for God, guess who you're going to act like? People who are living for God. But if we, act, we, ought to, we hang around with sinners, guess what you're going to act like? A sinner. I'll leave you one last scripture and I'm going to close. Romans 8.35. Paul says, Church of Rome, who, and we're going to add the word what, who or what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, Nakedness, peril or danger, sword. Today, what separates you from the love of God? What's keeping you from building that relationship with God? What's keeping you? In Christianity today, there's generations that are being missed. 
This is something I've, I've shared with some of the pastors. And I'm going to close. When I pioneered my first church, I was 26 years old. Most of the pastors in our fellowship today are around my age, are all in the 50s. There's about all of them that are around my age. They all pioneered the first church in their 20s. And the other ones did it in their 30s. Right now, we have we only have one pastor in his 30s in America, and only like two in their 40s. Everyone else is 50 or above. The youth, the ones in their 20s, the teenagers, the youth, 20s and the 30s. Where are you at with God? Has the world distracted us to the point that we keep our eyes off the prize of heaven? Did we forget that we are the hope for our families? I was 22 years old when I gave my life to God. And you know what? It was because of what God did, did in my life. My mom and my dad made it to heaven. Yeah. Who we are in Christ is so important that generations to come will serve God because of who you've allowed God to be in your life. Yeah. Where is the young people willing to stand up and say, you know what? I will stand in the gap. What makes you think that, well, that's just for the pastor. What makes me, I'm not special. I ain't no special person. I'm no special person at all. I do not have some great education. I don't have some fabulous background. And it was a born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Matter of fact, I barely had a plastic spoon in my mouth. Don't have that background. But what I have is a heart for God. So you young people, the world will distract you. It will tell you it's okay. It will inform you that it feels right. It, you think about it, it's okay. It sounds logical. But God has so much more. So much more. There's a generation that hasn't even been born yet that's counting on you today. Did you think about that? I've said this many times in the past. We're not building a church for you and I. We're almost in our sixth year. We're not building a church for you and I. We're building it for Cairo's grandchildren. Right. Think about that. We're building it for his grandchildren. If you, if you think that I'm crazy, go to the El Central Church. They're, they're almost at 50 years now. They got like five generations in a family going to that church. Incredible. Incredible. And the church started with a bunch of teenagers. My pastor was 14 years old when he gave his life to God in the El Centro Church. You are powerful. It is not just for the young people, it's for us old people too. But God has a plan for you. I like every head bowed and red clothes, just for a moment. Every head bowed and red clothes, just for a moment. No one looking around. This is just between you and God right now. This isn't about your neighbor, it's not about not about nothing. It's about you and God. You know, right now, I'm going to talk to you. I'm, I'm not asking you today what religion are you. I'm not asking what church you're from. I'm not asking you what your thought process is. I'm not asking you if you even understood what I said. The only thing I'm going to ask you right now is where's your heart at with God? Do you feel the tug of God in your life? Do you feel that pulling, saying, you know what? I'm tired of thinking my way. Because my way's gotten me nowhere. If that's you, and you and I can make a decision, I'm not asking you to join the church. I'm just asking you to make a simple decision and say, hey, you know what, Lord, I want to accept you in my heart. You know what? I'm going to make this attempt. You can be the Lord of my life, but I don't know what I'm going to do, but you know what? I'll let you guide me. If that's you, you're here. You say, God, you know what? I, today, I just want to accept you in my heart. If that's you, you're in this place. Whether you've done it before or not, and you'd like to accept Jesus Christ, can you just raise your hand? Come to this place, and God's dealing with you. Don't worry about what your neighbors do. Don't worry about what your friends do. Don't worry about your family. Just worry about you. Just say, God, right now, I need to be selfish, God. Today, right now, this moment, I need, it needs to be about me right now, God. I can't think about no one. I need to think about myself right now in this moment. God, I need you in my life. If that's you, you're here and you need Jesus Christ. You like to accept. It doesn't matter how old you are. But if you want to accept Jesus Christ in your heart, and that's you, you just raise your hand. 
God see this time. Is there anybody, anyone else? If you're here, you like to accept Jesus Christ in your heart to be the personal Lord and Savior. You just raise your hand. Amen. You raise your hand, amen. I want you to come forward. The rest of us, I'm going to put on a song. I'm going to put on a song. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to open up the altars. But I want you to take time to say, God, I need you in my life. I need to stop battling. I need to stop battling with you. I'm tired of this fight because I keep fighting and I'm swinging at the air and I'm doing nothing. The Bible says, Paul says that he beats his body into submission, that it may not control him anymore. Sometimes we need to beat ourselves into submission and say, God, it is you. So if God spoke to you, these altars are going to be open. I want you to come forward as we sing a song. The brother, you raise your hand. I want you to come forward. I want to pray with you. Amen. The rest of you, if God spoke to you, I want you to come find a place to pray. This world's always going to pull you. Your family, your friends are going to tell you what sounds good. But without God, we're nothing. So God spoke to you. These altars are open. You come find a place to pray.